Stan Hieronymus is here this week to talk about his new book, Brewing Local American Grown Beer. This is Beer Smith Podcast number 137. This is Beer Smith Podcast number 137, and it's November 2016. Stan Hieronymus joins me to talk about American Grown Beer in his new book, Brewing Local. Thank you to this week's sponsors, Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine. They're running an amazing deal right now, only $19.99 for a year-long subscription or $17.99 for the digital edition. Every issue of Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine is packed with articles for homebrewers and beer lovers. You can read my new column, Ask the Experts, as well. Take advantage of their special deal at beerandbrewing.com. Again, that's beerandbrewing.com. And also the world-class line of brewing equipment from Blickman Engineering. John Blickman has his first ever holiday giveaway, giveaway where you can win a Brew Easy system, quick carb, instant carburetor, Hellfire burner, or Brew Vision controller. You can enter for free by clicking on the banner at BlickmanEngineering.com. Again, that's BlickmanEngineering.com. And finally, Beersmith Mobile. The mobile version of Beersmith is a perfect complement to our desktop brewing software. It includes all the tools you need to create recipes on the go, share them with your friends, and act as a pocket brew timer. Check out Beersmith Mobile at beersmith.com mobile or on the Google Play, iTunes, or Amazon App Store. Today, my friend Stan Hieronymus joins me again. Stan is the author of Brew Like a Monk. For the Love of Hops and his new book, Brewing Local. Stan's new book uh, takes on the phenomena of American grown beer. Stan, it is uh, great to have you back on the show. Um, I'm a little amazed you keep asking me back, but thank you. So uh, tell us a little bit about this book. Uh, I got it right here. Brewing Local, uh, American grown beer. It's uh, it's pretty interesting. A lot of great stories in it. Well, you uh, the the two parts are it it does have a history of what you might call indigenous beer in the United States, uh, but it also m- much of it is looking at the ingredients that people are starting to brew with now. Uh, when you go back, when you think about the beginning of of uh, what we call craft beer in the United States, uh, in order to separate itself from uh, industrial beer, which was generally made with adjuncts, either corn or rice, um, brewers started to cling to the Rheinheitske boat and, and talk about brewing only with barley, yeast, hops, and water. Um, so it took some breaking out to go back and say, ooh, the, there were these other ingredients which were used historically. Uh, but now to take it to another step to use ingredients, as far as we know, probably were never used in beer before. So, I mean, if we go back and look at the long history of beer, uh, virtually all beer throughout history was really locally brewed with local ingredients uh, and often brewed right at home, right? Yeah, th- uh, certainly in terms of a time, time frame, when we go back 8,000 years, it was all hyper close and it's what ingredients you would have nearby. So if, if and, and in the case of hops, we're really going back only a little over a thousand years. Um, but at the point beer began to get shipped and then the ingredients began to get shipped, uh, that's more like the last 800 years. Um, and it took a little longer to make beer a commercial product. At that point, it moved outside the home. So, uh, but I mean, home brewing really was a standard, right? Yeah. And, and e- really even in the, the colonial days, right? At the first 200 years in the United States. So if you look at commercial production of beer in the United States um, in 1810, and it, this really persists it's the same numbers in uh, 1840 as well, on a commercial basis, uh, per capita production of beer was one gallon per person is all. So that's not very much. Um, and by the end of the century, it had uh, grown to 25 gallons per person. So is that per year, I guess? Yes, per person per year. Uh, and, that's, and that's a little more than, um, than people consume now. So it, it became an industrial product uh, beginning in the 1840s and the 1850s, and it continued to grow after that. And then meanwhile, we had this shrinking of uh, what we now refer to as styles. Uh, 
And so by the at in 1840, of course, there were no lager beers in the United States. And by the end of the 19th century, 95 percent of the beers brewed in the United States were lagers. Um, and for the most part, they were ad, uh, lagers brewed with 20 to 30 percent adjuncts, either corn or rice. Cool. Um, well, let's start with what you mean by local beer and also how that term has kind of changed over time. Well, if, it depends upon the space you inhabit uh, on the Internet. Some, some people want to just say all, all, the, all the ingredients in the beer come from nearby, say inside of 50 miles, 100 miles, sort of. That, that clings to the local boar food movement. Um, in my mind, uh, what makes a beer local at, at a level you would just say this is a local beer is where it's assembled. You know, the people are a gigantic part of it. And obviously water is one of the four ingredients and that's going to be local. Um, so if a, if a beer is made, I live in St. Louis um, and I actually uh, will soon have eight, a couple more breweries open. I'll have eight breweries inside of three miles of my house. I will call all of those local. But you can give your beer more local character when you start to use uh, ingredients that you find nearby. Uh, for instance, um, side project is uh, collecting wild yeast, using that in the beers. You know, other people, you could walk out in your yard, and this is more at a homebrew level. It's really hard to do at a commercial level, um, but you could uh, grow basil, for instance, and add that to your beer. So, so th I would say there are levels of local. Mm-hmm. Um, well, one of the interesting things I read in your book was uh, settlers were not uh, America's first beer brewers. In fact, they were predated by native Indians who brewed beer for several hundred years, right? Uh, yeah. So we have very little documentation of what the Pueblo Indians would have um, brewed, uh, but, but we do have the remnants of corn beers in their pottery. So the, and they, they came up from South America. So more than likely, they were doing either something like uh, chicha beer, which is still made in uh, South America. Dogfish Head has done a chicha beer, but they tried to make it more palatable. Um, people pay attention to chicha uh, because in order to get conversion, um, what the, the brewers and their helpers do is they chew the corn to begin with, and then they spit it out. Um, and, and that kind of replaces mashing. Um, what we do know is how the Plains Indians uh, made beer, uh, say, in the 19th century, because we have oral histories. So, for instance, Geronimo was uh, an avid fan of uh, the Indian beer, which was called Tiswin, T-I-S-W-I-N. Um, and the story is the last time they made a break for freedom is because he was angry uh, the soldiers had told him they could no longer make Tiswin. And one of his advisors was, in fact, all, Tiswin was made by uh, the women. So one of his trusted advisors was, in fact, the woman who made Tiswin. You know, when he's when he's polling the people around him and saying, what should we do? They s decide to make a break for it. Uh, they take off, uh, you know, about 100 total, and it, and it takes – more than 5,000 soldiers a year uh, to round them up. Uh, but this was simply because uh, he was mad because they could no longer have this corn beer. So he was upset about beer, obviously. Uh, yeah, that, that was the thing. And it, it, it was it was part of their life. It was part of the ceremonies and, it, and, and part of their culture. Uh, so it was important that, that they have this beer uh, when they would come back from a raid. Um, and they would have it for religious ceremonies. Uh, and it's in that way, it's the same role that the beer has played historically. If, if you go back to early times over in the European continent, it's, it's that same sort of, um, importance culturally. So was beer brewed by native Indians across the U S or, or only in a few, a uh, few okay. areas? It, it, it seems to be only, uh, west of the Mississippi and it's not exactly clear why. And in, in a way it doesn't make sense. Uh, but there, there are no signs. Maybe eventually we're going to find something where you would see, for instance, that it was, uh, made in the Southeast or uh, on the East coast. Um, because of course, 
when in pre-Columbian times there were more than a million uh, Native Americans on the continent and, until Columbus showed up with all kinds of disease and we began to uh, literally kill them off. Yeah. Um, well, what, what were some of these Native American beers like? You said most of them were corn-based? Uh, yeah, so they're totally corn-based. Uh, what, we, what we know of, uh, certainly the, uh, the Tiswin that uh, Geronimo drank. Um, and that, that was what, what, what the women would do. And it, as I said, their oral history will show you. So they would bury the corn um, in a little in dirt and then cover it up with grass and then put water on it. And this essentially was the beginning of the malting process. Once it would begin to sprout out, then they would grind the corn up and they would use it to make beer. Um, the descriptions don't make it, don't actually include a mashing process, but if, if you put enough time in there, uh, apparently you did get a low alcohol beer, um, <clears throat> which could be, they, they would, it, it's it probably began with what would, we would consider spontaneous fermentation, but then they would use yeast from one batch to, to another. Um, as they began to figure out, just as um, as brewers had over in the continent for thousands of years understood, oh, I have this, and I, I can take this yeast, even though we haven't identified what yeast is, and I can use it from one batch to the next. Um, so this year for Sabre, which is um, the Brewers Association um, the, the beer and uh, food event in Washington, D.C., um, Dogfish Head made, uh, I think it was about maybe a 15-gallon batch uh, of beer, which we didn't call Tiswin because it wasn't Tiswin. But they managed to malt corn, uh, but they uh, then they also uh, toasted wheat over mesquite, which mesquite, of course, is indigenous to the Southwest. So that, that would make a sensible thing. If you had brewers who began to learn other things, um, this would be an extension of what they would make. And then they used uh, th their own yeast because because they wanted to make a beer that was uh, drinkable. As opposed to this, this Indian beer uh, probably wasn't all that palatable. Um, and, and the nice thing in what Dogfish Head did is that they rolled out a new beer this year, a Saison, and they really put as much effort into that 15-gallon batch in R&D as they did in this larger Saison, which then became a release, release form. Um, and then the, we served uh, five gallons. I think it, it only ended up netting at 10 gallons. So they used, served five gallons at Sabre and then five gallons at the pub. Mm -hmm. It was you know really light on the palate. A little bit smoky, as you would expect, um, and had had a real spicy note, which certainly that would have been consistent with what what the Indians made, uh, because that native yeast, native wild yeast, naturally is going to be uh, a four VG producer, four vinyl guy call, which you which you get in bites and beers and Belgian beers. So, um, and I assume wheat, uh, I'm, they're, they're brewing with corn. Corn doesn't have a lot of enzymes either. So the, the mash efficiency, probably pretty low, right? Uh, very, very low. <laughs> so not a, uh, not a high alcohol beer, huh? Yeah. Uh, and, and that was the problem that, that, uh, that the first uh, colonial settlers had in, in the U.S. as well. Corn was here. Uh, corn is native. Barley is not native. Um, so they, they tried intermittently, you see efforts to, to, to brew with corn, um, back in the 1500s, as a matter of fact. Um, and, and certainly throughout time over, uh, in, in the 17th and 18th century in the Northeast, um, you know, you had your first, the Dutch were really the first brewers in the United States, uh, and the Dutch in upstate New York, um, they were using wheat, um, but they were also using some corn. Uh, but no, corn just was not it, first. It's, there, it wasn't efficient, and it really didn't have any flavor. Um, so those settlers wanted barley, um, and and two row barley, which they brought from uh, England and also from the continent, uh, grew okay on the coast or the coast up north. But as soon as they started to go inland, they realized that they, it it had disease problems. And the Spanish had brought in six-row barley. Six-row barley was much hardier 
grew much better. Um, this is be, at, at the settling at the time it uh, it was used in New York, of course, later um, into the middle of the 19th century, as people moved west, it was planted in the Midwest and it's and, and certainly up in um, in Minnesota, for instance, where which was a major barley growing region. Uh, this six row, of course, was uh, much huskier um, and did not have as pleasant a taste. Um, it made much darker beer, much cloudier beer. Um, it was not particularly popular. Mm. Well, that was the uh, next question I was going to get to, which is, uh, you know, when the first settlers did arrive in the U.S., what kinds of beer did they did they brew? Well, the, the, a lot of them, they were brewing the beers like they, they had at at home where they came from. Uh, so, as, as I said, ar- around Albany, New York, uh, which was a major brewing area at first, the Dutch, uh, they were making beer with wheat. Um, then the English began to... Uh, Another century later, you had more English style beers. Uh, so they, they were making ales mostly like you would have back in England. Um, we don't know exactly what the yeast was like, but they brought in yeast from England. Of course, it was changing over time. Um, you, you have, and I don't know if you had Chris White on recently, but. But if you haven't, you should to talk about the family tree of yeast. I did. Yeah, he was on. Uh, I can't remember three or four episodes ago. I think. Yeah. So the ho- the whole development of, of this yeast it comes in from Europe, uh, which is no longer wild yeast, which is uh, domesticated. So it's becoming uh, asexual, uh, not changing as much. But there's this constant selection going on that is, uh, you know, changing the way it flocculates and the temperatures you ferment at and uh, basically taming it so it no longer has those wild character. Um, and and by then people knew that they, they didn't want their beer to go sour, obviously, uh, but what was uh, preferred were beers with what we now know as uh, the four vinyl guy call, which is that clovey, spicy character. Mm. Well, you mentioned malt um, and barley. They they reintroduced barley, obviously, here because uh, it was a native plant. What did they do for hops? Uh, was that also uh, brought in? Well, th- there were there were wild hops growing, um, and they would use those wild hops at the outset, but they also imported hops and began. So by the time you were beginning to plant uh, uh, larger hop fields, those were those started from hops that they were bringing from the continent. Or from England, uh, so so you had people bringing in. Uh, um, you really said not identified as as Goldings and, and call Goldings until more like the uh, 19th century, but they're bringing those over. Things like uh, what was called Flemish Red, which is pr- probably um, Goldings may well have come out of Flemish Red. So so you had these continental land race hops, not particularly high in alpha. Um, not having certain characteristics that we now n- know American hops can contain. So they're less likely to have um, sulfur thiols than the continental hops. But what happens if, when, you, when you plant a field um, and you, you've got native hops nearby and you don't isolate them, the you're going to end up pollinating the female, the females. Um, those seeds are going to go on the ground. They're going to become part of your field. So if you're not working real earnestly to sort that out, then eventually you're going to get a, a hybrid sort of hop, which contains both the European genetic background and the American genetic background. And that's basically what cluster was and became um, you know, the the dominant uh hop in upstate New York when they were growing a lot of hops there. And then eventually actually on the West Coast and and it became the American hop clear into the 1970s. And uh, it was interesting, I had Ron Pattinson on a while ago and he mentioned that uh, in Scotland and England, a large portion of the hops actually there came from New York uh, when we're, you know, we're talking about like the middle of the 18th, uh, 1800s and so. Yeah, there was a a gigantic (laughs) uh, uh, hop growing region in uh, upstate New York. And 
and those, those hops were a little higher in alpha. Um, of course, they didn't measure alpha at the time, but they understood that they were uh, better for, uh, quote, keeping beer. So the, the, and, and that sort of translates into a little higher alpha. So it was a huge hop production area. In fact, I, actually, one of my relatives, uh, my one of my great 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 grandfathers on my father's side, grew hops uh, somewhere around Cortland, I believe, uh, Central New York. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, over time, we see a number of distinctly uh, American beer styles emerge. Uh, only only a few of those survive today. But I was wondering if you could tell us about some of the historical uh, distinctly American beer styles. Well, uh, well, one one you've had this uh, resurrection because in part became it, 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 because it became a BJCP style, and that's Kentucky Common, um, and and Kentucky Common was actually unique not not just to Kentucky but to the Louisville area um, and a little bit on the north side of the river into Indiana, uh, but you didn't even particularly see it at, over in Lexington, which is not that far away, um, and it and it sort of it brought a couple things together. You can go through the whole history of the 19th century and you'll constantly see references to common beer um, and people to say it, it's common beer and, and, and that it, it was somehow different than ale, but it, it was brewed with a top fermenting yeast like ale, but it was, but it was produced more quickly. So and more cheaply, so it wasn't tying up your tank time, and and so you'll you'll see lots of common, and then common uh, sometimes uh, was equated to cream ale, um, and of course we have a cream ale style, uh, which has a guideline now. But cream ale through the 19th century meant a lot of different things. It, it could be strong, not strong. Um, you know, it it could be not highly carbonated, almost like a cask beer, later highly carbonated, uh, not particularly attenuated, well attenuated. That's sort of a different story. But in in Louisville, Kentucky, which the brewers were uh, German, uh, say in the 1880s, uh, th there were 16 breweries, 50 of them were owned by Germans. And they took this common style, uh, which was fermented with the top top fermented yeast, and that they had harder water, um, and so they were using some colored malt, uh, so basically to bring their mash uh, into the pH they wanted. And they also, because by then, by the eight, 1880s, people were starting to use a fair amount of adjuncts, they made this beer with adjuncts, and it was immensely popular in the Louisville area. Um, accounting at the beginning of the 20th century for about 90% of the beer people consumed. It did not survive prohibition. So it became this sort of myth beer, which has been revived. Um, but, but tying into this, when we use the word common, uh, we have this other style that we call California common, which is probably not the best name for it. Uh, it's meant to reach back in time to the steam beers which of course, um, Anchor Steam, as important a beer in current uh, American beer history as you can find, because it was the first beer that Anchor made. Anchor's the first, is the beginning of the craft beer movement. Mm -hmm. But this, but the, that Steam beer didn't have much in common with common. Uh, because Anchor trademarked Steam beer Brewers needed to come up with another name, and starting with home brewers just for competitions. So they were making a beer, and they said, "We'll call it California Common." Um, so, but, so I assume when we talk about common beer, there was probably common beer at one time all across the United States, and they weren't the same style at all, right? Well, they they weren't they weren't a lot different, but yeah, you there, you would have uh, so certainly Minnesota Common was different than Kentucky Common. Um, and was different. The Kentucky Common is different than all of them because it was darker. Um, it was also uh, the one we know that it, that uh, in, embraced actually modern brewing because the Germans were on top of brewing technology, and it embraced the move towards brewing your beer with corn, which made your six row malt more palatable. You know, we started to talk about the six row before. Six row was made a much heavier beer. Um, and 
Anheuser-Busch was one of the ones that uh, understood that people wanted a lighter colored beer. They wanted a more stable beer. Um, when you had glassware, it looked nicer when you poured the beer. There were a lot of reasons to to get away from what six six row barley malt brought to the beer, but it was two row was very expensive to grow or import. And so Anton Schwartz um, brings this German um, uh, technology to the United States and convinces brewers that when you use this adjunct, you do two things. Um, first of all, you the combination of the six row and the corn lightens the beer. Uh, you get a more efficient mash. Now you're able to convert what's in the corn. Um, and that's when we got adjunct beers. So this is, and, this is a reemergence of corn back into beer brewing in the United States, right? Uh, right. When, when did that happen? When did they start uh, bringing well, corn about right back in? Um, yeah. and, it, and it happened rather quickly. Um, he introduces in 1870 uh, Budweiser beer, for instance, in 1876, um, and and certainly uh, Budweiser is not the only one to embrace it. Like I said, by by the end of the century, almost everybody was brewing with adjuncts because it gave people the beer they wanted to drink. Um, and it, just to be clear, it was it was a beer with much more hop character, much more flavor than you got in the adjunct beers, say, in the 1980s, mm-hmm. you know, when we began to have light beer. So, so at, at this dumbing down of American beer flavor, um, corn was complicit, um, but it, it was not the central villain. The people who decided to uh, eliminate flavor and make it cheaper uh, were more the bean counters. Yeah. And corn, of course, is cheaper than barley, I assume, most, in uh, most was, cases. But it was not at the time. No. Uh, Interesting. And, and it's not it, – it depends the scale you're operating now. For instance, at August Shell in Minnesota, uh, which makes um, you know some, some of their best-selling beers are made with corn, it is no cheaper for them to use corn than it would be to buy barley. But I was talking about, you know, like in the 1870s, I would assume that barley was quite a bit more expensive, right? No, it was not. No, okay, okay. Um, okay, so we uh, see corn reemerge. And uh, can you talk about a few of the other American styles that uh, you, you mentioned, cream ale, for example? Well, uh, as I said, cream ale was, a, over time, was a strong ale. And, and then later, um, Certainly, as as people started to want these lighter colored, uh, more carbonated beers, um, and and less full flavored, quite honestly, then then cream ale went that direction as well. Um, the beer that, that is that you could say is indigenous in the United States, unique in the United States, was steam beer, although that history is a little bit muddied. We know it begins in California in the 1850s um, when gold is discovered. Brewers go out there. Uh, they want to make lager beer. They take their lager yeast. Well, of course, you, they, they do not – it's not cold enough. Um, it's not – in in the Midwest, they would – you would have lakes that freeze. You would cut your ice up you would use those in the lager caves. So you had a place to lager your beer. Um, California was too moderate along the coast, so it never got cold enough, not until you had artificial refrigeration. Uh, in the late 1870s, could you make true lager beer? But if you if you look at what at newspaper advertising beginning in the 1850s, you see people advertise lager beer. And for a long time, they called this beer made with lager yeast, not at lager temperatures, um, lager beer. Not until lager beer is introduced in the 1870s, all of a sudden they start calling it steam beer. And it's the same thing that they were selling as lager beer. It's a little bit confusing. What also changed was the process that they made the beer, which was – so that these these Germans go and build breweries like, like they did in the Midwest, um, like they had at home – uh, which we now we, we tend to think of if you see a cool ship 
uh, you think of Belgian style brewing, you know, where, where beer is, uh, taken after boiling and put in, in this shallow tank, generally, uh, up in the attic so it can cool overnight. But this still takes place some places in Germany now, um, in, in very small breweries. So that was the way you cold your beer into that shallow tank. It's easy to imagine at some point that a brewer said, hold it, I'm, I'm trying to ferment my beer at a cooler temperature, take that same tank or generally build a second one. And that was called a clarifying tank. And you'll still see that if, if you see pictures um, of the Anchor Brewery, what looks to be, it is open fermentation in this shallow tank, that's a clarifier. And so that was taking place at a, at, in these very shallow tanks in order to that the lager yeast would work more efficiently. Mm. Um, and then additionally, the same thing happened but by when we began to understand how, because the, the, the first accounts, the process of making the steam beer are not until the 1890s. And by then they're also making a highly carbonated beer, but that was the style that was coming about in many different ways. So it's, it's an amalgamation. Um, it, it obviously changed a lot of things <clears throat> in the, uh, for instance, at the uh, at the beginning of the 20th century, somebody doing research on yeast not related um, to steam at all decided to go to a steam brewery, get some steam beer yeast, and he tried to make a lager beer with it. Would not work. Hmm. It could no longer ferment the beer because it was used to operating at warmer temperatures in these va very shallow uh, clarifiers. So you can see how it changed over time. So it, it became something unto itself. Well, as brewing evolved, uh, we also see the cultivation of native ingredients uh, all, all across the United States. Can you talk about uh, some of the native ingredients uh, we used? Well, when there's always this interest in... Uh, recreating historic beers. So you find a recipe, for instance, uh, for a beer with persimmons. And so persimmon beers were around. Uh, people use spruce. Um, to a lesser extent, there were pumpkin beers, but that little bit of history of the pumpkin beer, of course, led to a revival of pumpkin beers today, which are an entirely different entity. You know, pumpkins provided a little bit of uh, fermentables. And that was certainly when you, you look back at those beers that you could see they were used to emulate ingredients that people were used to. So spruce acted more like hops. Uh, persimmons provided a fermentable. Um, in the case of pumpkins, that they literally were squeezing that down to the juice in order to get something fermentable could take the place of um, maybe to work with corn uh, or take the place of barley. So it, it became an ingredient so you could create a, a fermentable. So um, you have several chapters on local ingredients that are well outside the four original ones. Uh, yeah. What are some of the other interesting local ingredients? You mentioned just a few there. but Well, what, what What's going on now is, is people looking and saying, what's, what's local? Um, you know, what can we find around us? Like, um, and quite often, okay, they're not going to scale. You're not going to see this in a Sierra Nevada beer that's uh, sold across the country. Uh, but where you use something like, say, pawpaws, which are the largest native fruits in the United States, uh, for that matter, people just using uh, local fruits. Uh, so, you know, if you've got a guava tree, then you're grabbing the guava off that and adding that for flavor. <clears throat> uh, what people can go out and forage, and this is a crossover. You know, there's there's great interest in in foraging uh, for for food or or things you're going to cook with that become part of what you serve at the table. And I I think that's an important part to remember. What many of these ingredients do is add nuance to the beer. You don't necessarily um, want people to say, oh, this has pawpaws in it or this has sweet potatoes in it. They, they become part of a, a greater whole. And when you do that, you can find things certainly uh, in your own yard. 
uh, or you can grow them like uh, like basil. There's there's so many different uh, basil plants, and 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 basil of course includes or has many of the same essential oils that you find in hops. Um, so if if you dry basil a beer, you're going to add some of that same fruity character as hops. You don't want to use too much, of course, or it becomes a pizza beer. <laughs> Pizza beer, well, maybe be good with jalapenos, right? Um, yeah, or I guess um, uh, dried tomatoes. Dried tomatoes, yeah, ones. dried tomatoes. Um, well, craft beer breweries have been experimenting with uh, local ingredients as well, and and reviving some uh, some lost styles. Can you talk a, talk a little bit about some of the experiments going on right now? Well, I, I, I think a lot of times people are taking it and, and are beginning to understand, uh, you know, how it's going to work with a particular yeast or, or malt profile. Uh, beer to guard, for instance, seems to work as a nice base for a lot of things. So people might, uh, you know, for instance, uh, if there are mushrooms, chanterelle mushrooms are, are, are particularly uh, tasty ones. Um, so uh, chanterelle on a beer to guard base makes for a pretty interesting beer uh on, on the other scratch brewing in southern illinois has pretty much been the uh poster child for foraging for beers they don't make a lot of beer in the course of a year about uh 200 barrels um and that's that's total for the year um but th they do a lot of things a lot of mushrooms beer they they had a um a mushroom beer um uh, um, with a black mushroom, I'm trying to remember what the, which mushroom it was. But anyway, it was it was just and using a saison type yeast from a local brewery, um, and it was like an excellent Belgian double with an earthy note to it. Um, so th these don't need to be gimmick beers, as I said. That they're mostly things that add nuance. Um, again, what Scratch has done and other people have done is to use other parts of the beer. Brian Hunt at uh, Moonlight Brewing in California has been doing a long time um, with uh, certain trees and, and they do it at scratch as well. And that's to use almost every part of the tree. So uh, from maple trees, birch trees, and sycamore trees, you can take the sap and use it in place of water in your recipe. The, these are not, people think about maple and you think of maple syrup, but the sap itself is only uh, it's only only going to add a little bit of gravity but it adds a, a lot of mineral character um so that adds flavor at that level but then you can of course um take the, the bark um you can turn hickory bark into a syrup that you add later into your beer um you can take acorns um and and grind them up uh and they're going to add tannins to your beer just like oak will on its own. So there's there's basically looking at everything. You can look at something like the dandelions. You can take the flowers, which are going to add a floral character. Let's say you add them at knockout. On the other hand, you can toast the roots, um, and they, they, they're they going to add a certain amount of bitterness and um, a different flavor if you use them earlier in the boil. So it's using people starting experiment with all parts of the plant, a lot of carryover with uh from the culinary side as well i had um andrew stanley was on and john mallet was on a couple episodes back and uh, one of the cool innovations they were talking about was uh the resurgence of small hop growers and small malt houses uh all around the country literally uh you know basically local ingredient suppliers um um wh how do, what role do you see them playing in the craft beer revolution that's going on well um that it's certainly going to be interesting to see uh, because uh, they don't operate on the same scale, which means what they provide is going to be a little bit more expensive. And, and people need to recognize this and be willing to pay the price. But those, those it, it, the heirloom malts, you, you think about the same thing with, that you have with heirloom uh, tomatoes. A little trickier with, with something, um, for instance, like potatoes. Even when you go back in time, it's hard to get a lot of flavor out of a potato. Um, but it's still interesting to say we want to use uh, these heirloom products. Corn is another example. Certainly, um, it is, it, when you're reading books 
200 years ago about corn, it gets pretty confusing because they refer to Indian corn. And what we think of now as Indian corn is generally going to be that color corn and things like that. But there's lots of heirloom corn, which has a little more character to it. But also you can take that and then you can toast it. So it adds more flavor. Now people go, oh, yeah, you know, you save a little bit of the corn. You say, this is what we did it with. We toasted it. It adds a unique flavor. I've got off of the uh, your question about barley there. Um, uh, yeah, I was but, talking about the small but, barley and malt. Yeah, so, I mean, so, you know, corn, uh, uh, hops is being grown in central New York, for, for, again, for instance. We've got barley being grown across the, um, across right, yeah, the Northeast so, and malted locally. So, so what, what you're getting is people are going back and, and they're finding these interesting flavored barleys that were abandoned because they are not efficient to grow at a larger scale. Uh, and people go, ooh, I like this flavor. Um, so th- that, that's at, at the malted barley level, that's an interesting way to bring something to your beer that other people don't have. In the case of hops, um, we've got such demand nationally for hops and we're running out of space in the Northwest to grow them. So you have people stepping up in other regions saying, here's an opportunity. You also have people who want local products. Uh, It's a lot harder to do in North Carolina. They're really struggling in North Carolina um, to find varieties that will grow well. And of course, as we know, local beer is booming in North Carolina. So Michigan right now is the largest producer outside of the Northwest because you have some very large farms going in. And and what we're discovering is you you can take, and some people are going back saying they, they want to get these wild hops from before, um, which may or may not work out for them. Uh, but for instance, if you take Chinook, which as we know is a, um, a hop that, that comes across as, if, if you dry hop with Chinook, um, it's going to come across as very resiny and piney um, mm-hmm. in the Midwest, in Wisconsin and Michigan. It is uh, a much, I, I guess you would say, softer um, hop. So it's it's got it's got more of a pineapple and a, a little bit of a lighter tropical fruity character. Um, so one hop grower in Wisconsin, as a matter of fact, has renamed. Um, it's Chinook because people would buy it as Chinook and go, oh, this isn't Chinook. And you go try this other hop here and they're going, oh, I, I love this hop. It's got all this other character. So they've given it a different name. So we're going to start to see a rise of more the idea of terroir um, and understanding that this Cascade hop came from uh, Oregon. This one came from Washington. This one came from upstate New York. Um because, of course, the hops, the hops and the malt, they take on the character of the local soil and growing conditions, right? Uh, uh, most definitely. <laughs> and, and you're also seeing <clears throat> this interest in um, using local yeast grabbed right out of the air, which is always going to be distinctive because it has not been tamed yet. Uh, to go back to what we talked about, you know, Chris White, and, and talking about the, the family tree of yeast, all the industrial yeast, the ones they track for that tree, the ones that you can buy um, from the, the yeast houses are going to be domesticated. Um, the, the ones that are somewhat in the wild, can, can you really taste that yeast and say, oh, that, this tastes like a Missouri yeast to me, this tastes like an Indiana yeast to me? Um, I, I don't think you need to be able to to pick them out in a blind tasting to understand their local and um, for that to be important to you. And of course, what I find interesting in this whole thing is, uh, yeah, the home brewing and craft brewing revolution is we're kind of coming full circle again uh, to a place where brewing is done at a local level uh, or home level with local ingredients, kind of a neat, uh, neat circle there. Right. Uh, Yeah. I, it's when um, that, it, this started in 19 or 19 in, in 2011. Um, Eric Steen, who was uh, 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 trained as an artist, he, he now actually works for Hopworks in Portland, Oregon. Uh, he started this project called uh, Beer by Walking. And what he did, he, he took commercial brewers and home brewers, and they just went hiking, and it's outside of Colorado Springs. Uh, and the idea is you would just. Um, uh, be inspired by the hike and go back and make a beer. Over time, this has sort of changed where you're going with somebody who 
who understands um, the, the local flora so you're not picking things that can uh, poison your neighbors uh, and you're also picking things that will add interesting flavor, those sorts of things. Um, and th then they would hold these, uh, it was called beers by, beers made by walking festivals and people would serve the beers and generally the money then goes to a local environmental group. Well, when you go to one of these and you listen to a brewer tell the story about picking the ingredients for his beer and you see that connection that between the brewer and the beer, then as a consumer, that becomes your connection as well. So as a home brewer, when, when you're making beer with something that you've grown yourself or gone in the woods and, and collected, that you can see where that gives you a different relationship with your beer. If you happen to be sharing it with friends, telling them the stories, then I, I think that that brings everything together. Well, Stan, uh, I really appreciate you coming on the show and, and talking to us about your uh, your new book, which, of course, is uh, Brewing Local. Um, thank you again for coming here. Well, thank you for inviting me. So, again, uh, my guest today was Stan Hieronymus. Uh, thanks again for joining us. Stan is the author of the new book, uh, Brewing Local, as well as the books uh, Brew Like a Monk and For the Love of Hops. Uh, Stan, thank you again. Okay. Well, a big thank you to Stan Hieronymus for joining me this week. Thanks also to Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine. Every issue is packed with great information for brewers and craft beer fans. Take advantage of their fantastic sale now and get a one-year subscription for only $19.99 from beerandbrewing.com. And also the world-class line of brewing equipment from Blickman Engineering. John Blickman has his first-ever holiday giveaway where you can win in a brew-easy system, quick carb instant carburetor, Hellfire Burner, or Brew Vision Controller. You can enter for free by clicking on the banner at BlickmanEngineering.com. Again, that's BlickmanEngineering.com. And finally, Beersmith Mobile. The mobile version of Beersmith is a perfect complement to our desktop brewing software. Check out Beersmith Mobile at Beersmith.com mobile or buy it now on Google Play, iTunes, or the Amazon App Stores. Thank you for listening. I hope you have a great day. Brewing Week.